Two police officers, dressed in blue uniforms, pulled up to my garage in a patrol car. Quietly, I watched them from my hiding spot under the lift. It seemed odd to see happy police officers, but their faces turned serious as they approached. Confirming my identity, they shared sad news about my wife. Something happened at our house and she was in the hospital, but they couldn't give many details. Trying to leave in a hurry, they stopped me, wanting to know where I'd been for the past three hours. I assured them I'd been there the whole day and suggested checking with my mechanics for confirmation. With a bit of apology I admitted I sneaked out for 10 minutes around 11 a.m. to get coffee for all of us. While one officer talked with Mike and Pete, the other noted the coffee shop I visited. Then he asked to see my car. Without hesitation I agreed, saying my truck was parked outside. We walked to my truck and he inspected it thoroughly before allowing me to go to the hospital. Concerned, I listened as a hospital staff member explained Kate's injuries, the blood transfusion, and the ongoing surgery. It struck me as strange when the doctor half smiled during our conversation. Leaving the hospital the same officer stopped me again for more answers. We headed to the hospital cafeteria for some much needed coffee. They asked about my relationship with my wife. I told them we met and got married relatively late, eight years ago. Kate was a successful attorney who waited until almost 40 to start a family. They wondered why she was home on a weekday. I explained Kate quit her job a month ago to rest before pregnancy. Taking a break before embracing at least 10 years of domestic life. Wrapping up I shared my love for my wife. Stating we were doing well. And looking forward to having a baby. They inquired about John Barton. But I denied knowing him. And they walked away without an answer. Trusting my team to lock up the garage. I headed straight home. Two science experts and a detective were searching through my house. The detective introduced himself. Shared what he knew. And asked the same questions as the previous officers. Plus a new one. He wanted to know about a few drops of blood in the downstairs toilet. I told him I didn't know about it. Then, I asked the detective why they were focusing on me, and if they were exploring other possibilities. He assured me they had various leads and mentioned his colleague talking to Mrs. Ta Barton. Curious about John Barton, I inquired. Apologetically, the detective said it wasn't the right time for him to comment. They walked away, leaving me feeling confused. I went upstairs to the main bedroom and witnessed the unfolding scene, realizing I'd be truly shocked if I saw it for the first time. Earlier that day, around 10 a.m. at work, my thoughts wandered to closeness. It's not unusual. They say guys think about it about 67 times per waking hour, and men separated from their wives for a month can double that. Since Kate left her job, our two to three times a week dropped to almost zero. Kate seemed either upset, bored, or tired. Personally I thought it was because her normal life was ending, and she was scared. As a caring husband I didn't want to pressure her. She would come out of her fear at her own pace. I knew my life would change after having children, but I understood hers would be turned upside down. I kept daydreaming about our early years of marriage when our intimate life was anywhere, anytime. In any case, we tried to keep it fresh and new as long as our imaginations lasted, and then we gradually fell into the automatic mode that long-term partners often do. Snapping out of my thoughts, I realized I needed to act. Restore spontaneity. Head home now. And be close with Kate until you're completely spent. Having made up my mind, it's time to head home. I let Mick and Pete know I'd be away for a while. Pete asked if I could test drive the car he just worked on. When I returned home, disappointment hit me as I spotted an unfamiliar car in the driveway. My friend's visit messed up my plans. So, I decided to go inside. Maybe I could convince my friend to leave and salvage my plans. Without any suspicion I opened the front door. And I felt a shiver down my spine. I sensed my marriage was done. The unmistakable sounds of happiness echoed down the stairs. I always recorded a video whenever a client brought their car to the garage. Just to be safe from damage accusations. With my heart pounding, I hurried up the stairs, camera in hand, and peeped through the bedroom door. Yes. It was Kate. And yes, there was a guy I didn't recognize, happily on our bed. Suppressing the urge to react strongly, I turned away. Honestly, this was the toughest thing I've ever faced. My legs gave way, and I collapsed outside the door, utterly devastated. Dimly aware that they were reaching their peaks nearby, I couldn't tell how long I stayed there. Slowly, I realized all the sounds of their betrayal had stopped, replaced only by conversations. It was just as bad, 
and it still tore me to the core. Knowing I needed to think I understood I had to get out of earshot. Reacting emotionally would land him in the hospital and me, in prison at least. Quietly getting up, tiptoeing downstairs, I slumped on the sofa, away from the sights, smells, and most sounds of betrayal. Free from emotional distractions, I did what I knew best, and devised a plan. Get him out of sight, confront him, throw him out the back door undressed, and repeat the process with her. Without bruises and witnesses, I hoped to avoid a trial. Luckily, in my workshop, I had the perfect shock weapon. Two years ago, in the Army Reserve National Guard, I was tasked with clearing trucks, and that's where I found a handy device. They call it a stone grenade in the police world. Slightly larger than a regular grenade, it's a small canister with a lever pin ignition mechanism, made specifically for hostage rescue. While it's meant to cause minimal physical damage, the explosion comes with a flash of 8 million candles and a shocking sound of 170 decibels. The flash alone can stun a person for at least 5 seconds. Fueled by my newfound hatred, my mind quickly formed the rest of the plan. To avoid damaging my house I couldn't just throw a grenade on the floor. I took out the device, quickly glued a short piece of rope to it, and put a loop on the end of the rope. Prepared this way I tiptoed upstairs, realizing secrecy was no longer necessary. Clearly hearing men's moans from behind the bedroom door, I paused only to pick up my phone from the floor outside the door where I had dropped it, and glanced around the doorframe. It was evident that the second round of affinity was in full swing. My wife was satisfying her lover, caressing him below the waist. Mentally rehearsing the sequence of events I had decided on, I took a deep breath and took action. Stepping into the room, I looped the end of the rope around the hook on the bottom of the light fixture, leaving the device hanging halfway to the floor. I pulled out the pin, put it in my pocket and walked out the door, pressing my fingers tightly to my ears and closing my eyes. Even with my precautions the effect was amazing. I clearly felt the shock wave, and the bright reflected light through my eyelids. Following the plan, I jumped into the room again, ready for action. This time, it was my turn to be surprised. I don't know exactly what I expected to see, but it was nothing like the scene that appeared before me. Mr. Anonymous lay on his back in bed, and there was clear damage below his waist. Either nature had been cruel, or something crucial was missing. Kate lay on the floor, her eyes empty mouth moving like a fish out of water. Feeling confused I stepped back into the hallway to think. Suddenly, two terrifying screams echoed from the bedroom, followed by loud bangs and slamming doors. It hit me. I was in serious trouble. My plan had once again failed. Taking a quick peek into the chaotic scene, the guy stumbled out of bed, holding his groin and howling in pain. Kate was nowhere to be seen. Probably in the bathroom. We needed to get rid of any evidence. Going back into the room, I quickly found the detonator for the device, and added it to the rope. Not finding anything else, I assumed everything else had been destroyed. Approaching the bathroom cautiously, I found Kate on her knees, vomiting into the toilet. I had no desire to help her. I just didn't care anymore. On my way to the door, I noticed something on the floor and picked up a warm, soft piece resembling a tongue tip. In the first floor toilet, I disposed of it. They wouldn't be able to reattach it. Trying not to make a sound, I hurried down the street, grateful once again for our distance from neighboring houses. Halfway to the garage, I emptied my pockets into a roadside trash can. Ten minutes later, I was back in my small work garage. I called Pete and Mike, my dirty, oil-stained employees and friends. They rushed to me, sensing my alarm. I asked them to vouch for me for the last 45 minutes, and they agreed almost simultaneously, saying, Of course, boss. Before they could agree too quickly, I warned them that what I did was very serious, and once I explained they might not be so hasty to answer. I expressed uncertainty about the charges I might face, acknowledging that it could lead to jail time. Before providing an explanation, I put on my old overalls and rubbed an oily rag on my face and hands, preparing for the impending police arrival, which I expected. The guy stared at me, a bit surprised, as I quickly told them about recent events. Mike was the first to crack, trying to hold on for 15 seconds before bursting into laughter. This set off Pete, and soon we were all laughing uncontrollably. It took a full five minutes before we got ourselves together, and with handshakes and promises of support, they went back to their oily workspaces. Over the next hour, 
Spontaneous laughter echoed from various dingy rooms. My wife Kate was about to face the consequences she deserved for avoiding my humble friends. That evening, I cleaned up the master bedroom, washing the bathroom floor. I decided to get rid of the bedding and made a mental note to buy a new rug. Torn curtains also needed to be taken down. Trying to stay busy to avoid thoughts, the constant phone calls and knocking on the door didn't help. Yes, the media was in a frenzy. The mix of infidelity and a man losing his manhood was a story made for them. I only opened the door once and quickly turned off the phone. Finally, with no distractions, I began to reflect. Did I regret what I did? Strangely, no. I despised cheaters and had seen many become unrecognizable when catching their partners. Oddly, even before lunch, I was confident my wife shared this passion. I was shocked to be so wrong. Moreover, Kate's motivation astonished me. She appeared as devoted to me as I was to her, and our bed life had been fantastic. Well, until recently. After hours of inner turmoil I could only find one clue. I can still recall the uneasy feeling I had two months ago, when Kate said she was retiring to enjoy her last days of freedom. I thought she'd work until at least the seventh month of pregnancy. Something about her, wanting one last celebration, before having kids seemed strange. My personal cell phone broke into my thoughts. Not many people knew this number. The caller ID displayed Kate's parents' number. They lived about three hours away in the same state. I picked up since I always got along well with them. After fewer pleasantries than usual, her mother got straight to the point. She asked me if I knew why journalists were surrounding their house, mentioning that they would have to find out someday. She couldn't bring herself to go into detail. She then asked if I had watched the local news that evening. Maybe the main news, talking about a story about a cheater who bit off her lover's dignity. I always liked her mom's colorful language and her views on life, but it didn't make our conversation easy. Yes, mom, look. There's no easy way to say this. So I'll get straight to it. The woman's name is Kate. Luckily, my confusion was interrupted by a scream, followed by a beep. When I pressed the end call button on my phone, I noticed a warning on the screen. This reminded me that I wrote down the end of my marriage just eight hours ago. I had vague memories of leaving my phone recording outside my bedroom door. I knew that if I never knew or believed the reason why Kate did what she did, I would never be able to trust any woman again. There was a good chance that I would die a lonely misogynist, doomed to a life of uselessness. With desperate hope I started playing the video. I already knew what it was showing. The pain was too fresh to relive the scene. I opened my eyes just as I put the phone on the floor. Without a visual representation, just a view of the hall ceiling, I had to imagine Mr. B and Mrs. Infidelity lying side by side on the bed. I couldn't hear the sound clearly, so I downloaded the file to my computer and ran it through an amplifier. This is an important part of their conversation. Kate. It was fantastic. The past week has been great, actually. Does this really have to end today? My offer still stands. Just give me your word, and I will divorce Sarah and marry you. Well, yes. It looks like it will work. A great start to a marriage with a guy who left his wife and kids. No, and I love Dave too much to hurt him like that. In addition, he is a great husband and will be a good father. After today, I will be Mrs. W Goody goody, a housewife at least until the youngest of our children start school. You can't love him that much. It's not him lying here next to you. No, you're mistaken. I love him very much. The moment I met him, I knew he was my only soulmate. I will never meet another. I am happy that I have such a good man who spoils me and will nurse me when I get a big belly from his two or three babies. No, I want nothing more than to die in his arms, surrounded by our grandchildren. Well, that was a great speech, but it begs the obvious question. Why are you with me now? At least Kate had the humanity to think about it. There was silence for a good half a minute. I guess she just missed the past. She didn't get married until she was 31, and was a bit of a wild girl. She missed the excitement of walking into a bar and catching the attention of various guys. The thrill of leading a guy on and deciding impulsively whether he would get what he wanted or not. Recently, Dave had been spending his weekends deer hunting with his buddies. Three weekends ago, she took a trip down memory lane and visited a bar. The night turned out to be okay but unsatisfying. Then, last Saturday, she happened to walk into the same bar I was at. And here we are. God, she's so cold. Kate, just consider this the last hurry. Anyway, what is she complaining about? Come here. I turned off the sound. 
At least now. I knew that I was a good lover and husband. The problem wasn't me. The following days passed in complete disappointment. Two days later, the reporters packed up and left my quiet street. The hospital administrator called me and mentioned that Kate would appreciate some pajamas. I missed this detail. She would have to endure those humiliating hospital gowns. Two days later, her father reached out to me. He apologized for his daughter's behavior and expressed hope that I would stay in touch to try to improve the situation. He reminded me that he has another daughter who recently went through a divorce. Sorry, Dad. It's just too weird. Four days after this event, he appeared on the news again. Mr. Not-So-Big-Deal had been released from the hospital. Reporters dug into his past and revealed him as a serial cheater. They took some satisfaction in announcing that while surgeons managed to sew his manhood back together, it was doubtful it would work as intended. At the week's end, an unexpected visitor arrived. Mrs. Barton or Sarah, as she preferred, was a pretty lady with sad eyes. She'd heard rumors that I might have evidence for her divorce case. I explained it might be true but admitting it could put me in a difficult spot. She understood and apologized for asking. I assured her there was enough circumstantial evidence that she probably wouldn't need what I had. If I'm wrong, I'd try to persuade her to reconsider. Her sadness touched me deeply. Playing her the aftermath of the big explosion from the video, she initially cowered at her husband's screams but quickly composed herself. To say she was not very sad when she left would be an understatement. Being helpful, I invited her to pick me up if the sadness returned. And that wasn't the last time I saw Sarah Barton. The last visitor was probably the strangest. On Saturday, the detective I spoke to at the house showed up at my door. The suit from the big event disappeared, replaced by jeans and a shirt. Hey son, no, I won't come in. I just wanted to say that if there was insufficient evidence, I recommended closing the case. Expressing my gratitude, he turned to leave but stopped, looking back. Listen, at the end of the year, I will retire. If I come back after this, will you tell me how you did it? I just smiled and wished him a good day. Kate's letter arrived on a Tuesday. It began, my dear Dave. I can't find the words to say how deeply sorry and ashamed I am for what I've done to you. I understand why you couldn't bring yourself to visit me, and I want you to know that I forgive you. No strings attached. I never realized the full consequences of my actions, and I certainly never expected my parents to disown me. Losing your love, trust, and respect is more painful than I can express. I'll respect your decision if you never want to talk to me again, but I hope explaining why I did this might help in your healing process. It's all my fault. The doctors say I won't be able to speak normally for a long time if ever, as I accidentally bit off the tip of my tongue. They're exploring an experimental stretching technique to restore some function. I hope it works so I can return to my career and distract myself from this loveless, childless future. Feel free to ask for anything in the divorce, and I'll sign it. If you could keep me on your health insurance for a bit, I'd be forever grateful. Farewell, my love. I wish you nothing but happiness ahead. I hope I haven't completely ruined your life. Yours sincerely, Kate, also known as your cheating wife. Her letter touched me deeply, prompting a change in my decision. I sent her pajamas to the hospital. Now, where are Mick and Pete's phone numbers? Do I owe them a beer? Keg?